All the pretty girls stand up. All the pretty boys stand Sweet. up. Pretty boys in the building. Sweet. This right here is my sway. Sway. All the girls are on me. Damn. Everybody pay attention. This right here is my pretty boy sway. Get out the way, pretty boy coming through. They say if you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. Well, I've been looking for a long time, and I feel its eyes all around me. We live in strange times. Fact has been blurred with fiction. And in this city of madness, seeing doesn't always mean believing. It means questioning. I like it that way. Questioning people's intentions. Questioning one's surroundings. And sometimes, questioning your own sanity. Let the abyss step back at me. I want it that way. I need to be seen. Because truth isn't something you find. It's something that finds you. Hey everyone, I'm Mickey Finnegan, writer and creator of the comic book series Sanity, as well as founder of Swagglehoss Entertainment and Publishing, and of course, as some of you guys may know me, Swagglehoss from the YouTube channel. And I want to say welcome officially to the launch of our Kickstarter, Sanity Rise of the Occult. So what is Sanity? Well, Sanity is a comic book miniseries set in a Lovecraftian universe in the 1930s. It's a tribute and a throwback to that era of comic book storytelling that was made famous by the detective tales of that time. Our story opens up with our quick-witted and dry private investigator, Robert Grant, who has a fate encounter with Hollywood socialite and actress Catherine DeMoss, who hires him to investigate the mysterious disappearance of her playboy and business mogul brother, James. But as Robert starts to dive deeper into the case, he's met with strange eldritch symbols and occultist figures, which causes him to have to open up his understanding to that of the unknown. This Kickstarter celebrates the launch of issues two and three. We get to dive deeper into the mythos of Lovecraft. We find out more about Robert, the man behind the magnifying glass, and meet new and important characters that play a significant role in finding out what happened to James. We have an incredible team of artists working on this, and we are so passionate about the material. I truly hope you consider backing this campaign. We are building this world from the ground up, but have grand visions of where we can take it in the future. And I hope you come along with us on this ride. Thank you so much for your support and I will see you in the abyss. We are live and we are celebrating. We're making comic books. You guys helped me bring sanity to life the first time around. Now you guys are helping me bring it to life the second time around. And in just less than two hours, we actually got funded. This is super, super exciting. Uh, I, I knew that I wanted to stream today to just kind of talk a little bit about the campaign, uh, but I had to quickly change my thumbnail because I just figured like, oh yeah, it would go live and then maybe there'd be like, I don't know, hopefully one person, you know, that donated, uh, but uh, we funded. So I had to quickly change the th thumbnail and uh, now we get to take a little bit of, uh, you know, a victory lap. You know, I want to share with you guys the, the, the project that I've been working on. Uh, hopefully you guys find it interesting. Hopefully it, it's something that uh, you may want to consider backing yourselves. Um, but, you know, outside of all that, you know, with this live stream and everything, we got a lot of topics to cover. Comic book content 
wise. So it's not all going to be about me in this stream today. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about sanity. You know, we just get the word out there. But we got all sorts of topics. We have a CGC update this morning. And we know how much we all love our CGC updates. Those things always get super, super juicy. Uh, we have uh, X-Men 97 on the horizon, uh, actually set to come out tomorrow. And I want to ask the question to kind of you guys and everyone out there, you know, what do we think about this show? Is it going to have any impact on the comic book market? One of the things that I felt, at least in my like niche of WhatsApp group people, is that, um, you know, I have some high school friends that, that they caught wind of the fact that X-Men 97 was coming back. And they started talking about the nostalgia of like, this is the show that got me into comic books, like people who they're not into comic books anymore. So I thought it was really interesting. And I'm curious to see if it's going to have any effect on the comic book market. I mean, I know that it already has had a little bit of an effect on some of the hot trending lists, which we'll talk about, of course, later on. There's MCU projects to talk about. We'll see if that has any implications on, you know, comic book market stuff. And then also um, we have the Platinum Heritage Auction just a few weeks away with maybe some of the biggest books, certainly the biggest comic book that will have ever sold. This is already guaranteed that this is going to be uh, the world record for a comic book price and Action Comics number one. I uh, just kind of wanted to preview it with you guys, talk a little bit um, about what potentially the sale will be and um, you know, see if we can put a guesstimate on uh, what the uh, number actually is. But before I really get into it, Let's say hi to everyone in the chat. You know, I know it's early morning. I hope you got your coffee. Now let me take a little sip. Say hello, hello. Uh, we got AG paid my pledge. You are getting close already. Thank you, AG. I think you, uh, yeah, your comment was at 834. And so since you commented, we hit it. So I appreciate your pledge. Um, Benny in the house. Hey, everyone. Hey, Benny, what's going on? Uh, Austin in the house. Yo, Sway, got a pledge in. Congrats on already hitting the goal. Austin, I appreciate you, man. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it, it's it's such a humbling experience to uh, get anybody to support. So I'm I'm eternally thankful for everyone that is you know willing to uh, give me the chance on on this endeavor and this project. I mean I know you guys know me as a YouTuber who covers collecting and comic book market stuff, but like outside my YouTube, you know I work and create the creative field and I do writing and stuff. So yeah, it, it's it's a little bit of like a leap of faith to connect the dots for people to trust me um, on this front, but. But um, I appreciate it, and I hope you. I hope you like it. Uh, Holy heart lit with the. I dig it. I assume that means with the trailer. I appreciate it. Uh, Thomas B. Good morning, Swice. Will there be a sanity NFT? Uh, at this moment in time, there's going to be no sanity NFTs. Uh, you know, the, I, I'm like I mentioned in my video I released uh, the VV one. I, I definitely am of that side of the you know collector base that's a little more open minded to the ideas of. NFTs and blockchain and crypto and all that stuff. Um, that said, I'm not like a big VV buyer, but um, yeah, it's at, at this moment in time, Sanity will, will not have a NFT, but maybe in the future. Cause I do think that that's going to be the way for creators to um, get residuals, you know, on their work. Uh, Gordon with the truly scary artwork. Yeah. The, the artwork is amazing. Santiago Spina doing the um, pencils and inks. Um, I have a great team, Maxim Strelkov doing the colors and Davis and Mains doing the, uh, the um, letters as well as a, a plethora of variant cover cover artists. Uh, we got Nando in the house. Let's go swag. Congrats on full funding. Thank you, Nando. I appreciate you. Uh, if you guys don't know, Nando uh, is going to be set up at WonderCon, you know, the comic book dealer, his booth. I'm going to be making an appearance there on Saturday, which time I forget. Did we agree to 1 p.m., 2 p.m., something like that? I'll talk about it later on um, when we get into it. Uh, Benny Torres, congratulations. Uh, Carissa, what's going on, Mickey? Good to see you. Actual Dracula in the house, what's going on? Good to see you, man. We got uh, Prince of Cheese in the house, what's going on, Prince of Cheese? Uh, and then Ricardo as well. Ricardo, thank you so much for being a channel member. I appreciate you. All right, well, before we get into our main topics, which is, like I said, we're going to get into CGC. It's going to be interesting. And, I, and, and this is great, you know, to have the live experience because I can get some of your feedback. We're going to talk about X-Men. We're going to talk about Action Comics number one, MCU projects, things like things like that. I do want to just quickly show you guys that I launched the Kickstarter. You know, I, I, it's like, let me just be honest. I've been up all night. You know, I was up all night. I went to bed at 4 a.m., woke up at 6 a.m., 
uh, you know, just crossing the T's and dotting the I's is very nerve wracking, you know, launching this thing. Uh, you know, I, I want it to be great. I want to make sure that there's no typos and spellings and all this sort of stuff. Um, and I'm very, very excited that we hit our goal. Oh, look at that. $11,000. The, the goal was 10,000 currently 49 backers. You know, we got a couple whales in there, which, you know, I appreciate the whales. Um, very, very, you know, helpful and needed uh, for us to, to, to get to uh, the goal. And um, yeah, maybe by the end of the stream, we'll have a couple more backers, but uh, you know, Sanity, Rise of the Occult, Comic Book Issues 1 through 3. It's a Lovecraftian comic book. Uh, you know, it's a throwback to the detective style of comic books that, you know, really comic book storytelling was built upon, right? I mean, you go back to the tens and the twenties. That's when the pulps took over. Detective stories, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the shadow characters like that. The film noir really took its precedent there, and then that would then transition into DC comics, literally detective comics. So uh, this was sort of my way of being able to kind of play in that that field. You know, I'm a, I'm a big vintage comic book collector, as as are a lot of you guys. And so for me, it's it's to live in that world, to play in that space, to set the period. Um, at that time is is really fun. It's it's a lot of fun. Lovecraft lends itself to that. You know the cosmic horror. You know the the fear of the unknown, juxtaposed to the private investigator whose job it is to find you know truth and the known. So he's always kind of lends itself to really really good storytelling. And um, and yeah, here we are. You know this is the second go around. Uh, we had issue number one come out last year with uh, with uh, Sanity. Um, Got that one out there, and uh, now this is issue for issue two and three. This uh, Kickstarter mainly, and you guys can see right here we got some of the covers. Uh, of course, I like to have my A covers done by my interior artist, which is kind of a lost art form. I feel like maybe not in the indie space, but certainly in the Marvel and DC space, like the you know the big two publishing. You rarely see the interior artist doing as many covers these days, and I think it has to do with the fact of like you know it's the pipeline, it's the turnaround. It's getting people to buy the book. Like, you know, you may want to get a little more expensive cover artist. Um, but but for me, it's about telling the story, you know. So Santiago uh, wanted to do the covers and and I, I, I was happy to have him do it. So covers two and covers three. Of course, we have variant covers, which, you know, you got to have. Uh, I have one right here done by Ivan Tao. Ivan Tao is a fantastic modern cover artist. Um, which to me was kind of a no brainer to bring them onto this because, you know, that I like variants that give people a different look, a different option. You know, it's, it's, it's not just a variant to be a variant. It's like, here's like a completely different aesthetic, which, you know, if you're not into the vintagey old detective look and you want something a little more modernized, I mean, Ivan is your guy. Uh, I also got Jenna Cha, who, if you guys are collecting modern comic books, there's a series called The Sickness that came out this last year that absolutely went crazy, secondary market. I mean, it was like selling like hotcakes. And she just has this eerily like abstract yet beautiful um, style of work, which I thought would be really cool to kind of add like a, a negative space cover uh, for us right here. So that's uh, another one, we get into the story. And then of course we had to bring back the EC homages, which I did last time. Uh, Lucas Kettner, once again, who is uh, currently working on the series called Count Crow Crowley. Uh, we we did two more here, which this one is definitely an homage to the Crypt of Terror issue. If you guys happen to know it with the werewolf, you got to have the uh, newspaper flying in the wind. Uh, trying to do a little bit of an innuendo cover here, a little bit of that Archie flair. Spill the beans, Stacy. How'd the date go? Let's just say when the lights went out, he was a real monster. Badoom. There you see him right there. Uh, and then this one, which another one, of course, the story takes place in the 30s, Hollywood, film, starlet, that sort of thing. So you got to have the uh, old school camera. You got to have the red dress. You got to have the skulls. You got to have all the elements. So those are sort of my covers that I just kind of wanted to share with you guys and you know talk a little bit about them. Um, I also have this beautiful painting, oil painting done by um, Jarrell Threat. He's a pretty well-known Magic the Gathering art artist. Um, we've worked on similar sets actually in our in our careers. And um, I wanted to have him do a key art piece for us, which actually that oil painting is for sale, the original oil painting. So um, yeah, just a couple you know, covers right here and we got great tiers, you know, you can back it, read more about the creatives, some add-ons, 
Here's all the things that you can get. Shout outs in the book. If you're a business, comic book business, you want to do some ad stuff, I'll shout you out on the channel. We can do a collaboration. Uh, you get some original art pieces right here. Get an original oil painting, as you guys can see. So really cool stuff overall. But that's kind of where we're at. That's, you know, that's the project so far. Looks like we have up to 50 backers. So this is super exciting. So I appreciate you guys. Uh, let me check back in here with the chat really quick just to see how you guys are going or how you guys are doing. What's going on this morning? Like what's what's new with you guys in comic book land? Congrats from the Spider Boy King and the current reigning Remark King, Hell Destroyer Comics. Love the first issue. Guess I have to buy this one too. Hell Destroyer, I appreciate you, man. Uh, go give uh, Steel Cartel and Hell Destroyer on Instagram a follow. He's a, he's a good dude. And he is the king of remarks. He is 100% the king of remarks. I'll do a remark for your copy if you want. I can't draw, but I can doodle. Uh, comic Shell, what's going on, Comic Shell? Go check out the Comic Shell if you guys are looking for um, a great way to carry your CGC slabs. Although, maybe we're not okay with CGC slabs anymore. Because I think that leads us to the next story we have to discuss. The next main story that we need to talk about is an update from the CGC lawsuit. Actually, two updates, because one of the updates I didn't actually cover on the YouTube channel yet. This new update actually came out this morning, you know, funny enough, with the launch of my Kickstarter. And I was like, okay, we, I definitely have to talk about this. Um, but we have to discuss both of them. So uh, this is coming out of the Paul Lesko Twitter, which, of course, if you guys happen to know, Paul Lesko is the hobby lawyer. He, uh, he is an attorney who actually is a big, big uh, comic, uh, excuse me, a big, big card collector, sports card collector. Uh, but he recently broke some of the news with regards to um, CGC and some of the cases of what's going on. He was the one that actually uh, made it known in the community that uh, there was an employee working internally that was stealing comic books and actually had him on the channel to break down some of these cases. But he actually had an update this morning on the Ulysses Zanello case. Now, for clarification purposes, Ulysses Zanello is the one that is the Mark Jeweler Fuller, the Reholder Gate guy. Uh, that is the actual case that is going on. And where we sort of left off with it uh, is they were asking him to do a cease and desist, and then that actually got tabled. So we didn't get any update uh, from what was supposed to go on. And one of the reasons why it got the can got kicked down the road was because presumably the lawyers were having some kind of conversation regarding a settlement. Well, Paul had this tweet this morning uh, at uh, 758, or actually, excuse me, it was, it was late last night, uh, where he actually said, and the defendants won't respond to the complaint in CGC versus Zanello because the parties have made significant progress towards reaching a resolution. So this case is now on its last legs. It'll be settled soon and then will be over. So here is the official filing. Let's kind of read through it together. Just have a little bit of uh, clarity on this. Uh, Dear Judge Castell, the firm represents defendant Ulysses Zanello is the above reference action. The parties have made significant progress towards reaching a resolution. Given recent correspondence with the council, we write to respectfully request a three-week extension of the deadline for defendants Ulysses Zanello and Bree Riva to respond to the complaint filed by Plaintiff Certified Guarantee Company, LLC, in order to provide the parties additional time to negotiate towards settlement of the action. Defendant's current deadline to respond to the complaint is March 18th, and with this extension, defendant's deadline would be extended to April 8th. There has been one previous request for a two-week extension of this deadline, which was granted. Plaintiff's counsel has consented to the extension request, and counsel for Ms. Riva joins in it. Next conference before the court is scheduled for July 22, 2024. We thank the court for its consideration uh, of this request and remain available at the court's convenience to address any questions or concerns. So there is the official update. Now you'll have to take me as someone who cannot really speak legalese, but as far as I understand it, you know, this was a civil trial uh, that actually had a date looming on it in that July mark. Uh, so Zanello's attorney has filed, uh, for an extension, uh, for this trial, because it seems like him and CGC are going to reach terms. They're going to reach a settlement. So this is kind of where we are with it. I mean, this is something I actually talked about, uh, in, you know, previous coverage of this, um, ongoing investigation of this case. Of course I did cover the fact that it was looking like Zanello was going to settle out of court. And this pretty much puts a bow on it. I mean, Paul is basically going 
stopping just short of confirming the fact that, yeah, this is usually an indication of the parties are very close and um, we should hear it soon. So I think what's interesting about this is, you know, what is frustrating, I think, for a lot of people and what I'll reflect back from the comments that I see in some of my videos is that, you know, a settlement doesn't really mean anything, right? It, you know, CGC kind of came out and said that, you know, or at least Matt Nelson said that, you know, we want to pursue him to the fullest extent of the law. Settlement isn't really living up to that, you know, because for all we know, the settlement is a, you can never submit to CGC comics again, and you owe us a thousand dollars, you know, for all we know, that could be what the settlement actually is. Um, so it really doesn't, you know, set the precedent or set the precedent for, you know, uh, wrongdoers to not want to try this thing again. Um, one of the speculation sort of tinfoil hat things is that, you know, CGC as a company probably doesn't want this to go to trial because if it goes to trial, then there's that element of discovery, then everything has to come to light. You know, then there's going to be Paul Lesko, you know, covering all the filings where he says, this is how Zanello actually did it. This is where he, you know, sent the books. This is how he was able to fool the reholder program. And all of a sudden, you know, that becomes public information, you know, that there's all of a sudden transparency into some of the flaws of what's going on in, in CGC. And if Zanello's team, you know, is actually fighting this, they're probably going to drum up all sorts of ideas of like, oh, it's CGC's responsibility, this and blah, blah, blah. And then who knows where it goes from there. I mean, the judge himself could, you know, end up sort of saying like, yeah, okay, this, you guys actually owe this, or this is, you know, your fault or whatever it is. And so I have a feeling that settlement on CGC's end even though it seems like this is what Ulysses Zanello would like, I kind of feel like this is actually what CGC wants. Um, so it's really, really interesting. And this is um, also something similar to what we saw with the Terrazas case as well. Uh, let me pull that one up. This is one that uh, actually Ryan from Automatic Comic Books uh, did a great video covering this one. Uh, I didn't actually cover it because I was uh, you know, knee deep in Kickstarter world. But uh, this one right here is for Terrazas, who, if you guys remember, Terrazas is the internal employee who ended up stealing comic books. Uh, and I did actually, I do actually think swapped labels. Uh, so this was the inside job one. Uh, but uh, Paul basically said, uh, for CGC versus Terrazas, you may wonder what happened at the preliminary injunction hearing. Well, nothing, because it got bumped and won't happen if it does happen until April. Uh, why do I say if it does happen? Because according to the filing, the case may settle before then. So once again, Another case, probably going to settle before then. And I expect it to settle, you know, I mean, especially if uh, it being an employee uh, who was working at CGC. And I think this is just something that we could have expected, right? Like, I think that this is uh, even all the way, you know, weeks ago when this stuff was first coming out. I mean, my speculation was that this is going to settle out of court, you know, and we're never really going to know, you know, what happened. With this thing, and and I think that uh, comic book collectors are very very frustrated, and you know for good reason, and we see that anger and that frustration being you know put out into you know the comment section of uh, videos like uh, when they release their nine nine you know how nine nines and ten os are actually uh, graded videos, and so um, before I get get into this, I did want to kind of visit Comment Town to to see what people are saying, but. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting to kind of share and reflect uh, some of the sentiment of the community. Uh, let's take a look here at the chat really quick before I jump into it. Comic Shell says, uh, that's okay. Comic Shell is great for books in top letters and even Ross too. Ah, very good. You know, and also CBCS books, right? You can put CBCS books in there. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll not get much info and it'll be settled for an undisclosed amount. Yeah, undisclosed amount. I mean, I wonder if they're even going to hit them for that much money, right? Like what, it, what, what was the total? of the the books that that were actually presumably on that list i think it was in the two million dollar range 1.5 million dollar range something like that like do we really think that zanello is liquid you know like one five two million probably not you know it, i i think when i had paul on the channel he mentioned like you know it's probably going to be like a 200 300 400 grand thing that he just has to pay out you know for the rest of his time and so we'll see what happens um, how is the investigation into how CGC reslammed hundreds of fraudulent books going? 
Uh, well, we just talked about it, Holy Harlot. I mean, uh, it's a cover-up of CGC complicity, that's all. Well, I don't know if it's a cover-up so much as a, you know, they just don't want to have to deal with it, right? I mean, we could put on the tinfoil hats and, you know, maybe there's some conspiracies there, but it's sort of hard to know if, like, there's actually, you know, nefarious deeds going on. Although it could just be nefarious in the sense that, you know, they have a little bit of malfeasance of what happens, you know, in their doors. Um, but I wanted to pull this up to connect the CGC story because this was a popular video I put out last week reacting to, of course, the CGC, um, what do you call it? The nine nines and tens video. And I just kind of wanted to go down to the comments because actually Ryan did something similar in my video as well. And so I thought it'd be funny to kind of visit some of the sentiment in the community and just cover some of the highlights. Uh, Jive Turkey here said, uh, let me take you through how we're going to completely undermine 20 years of grading so we can make some quick cash. And that was definitely one of the most upvoted comments right there. And I thought that that was uh, pretty poignant, pretty interesting. You know, I think uh, based on what the video showed to us was that all of a sudden CGC, it seems like is going to be giving out more nine nines and tens. Now, I think there's a case to be made that it makes sense to do that. Like, I mean, like I've said in my reaction video, this one right here, I, I did say like, you know, they have these books coming straight from the printer going right into, you know, CGC's facility to be graded. So it does kind of beg the question, like why isn't there more nine nines and tens? Like why aren't there quote unquote perfect books, especially based on the way that CGC is grading. And I think, you know, I think CGC knows that. I think that for them, for whatever reason, the company was built off the idea that 9.8 was, you know, the thing to do. Like the, that was how the company was built. So I, I think, you know, at a certain point, they, they kind of decided like, we probably should have just been giving 10s and nine, nines from the beginning. And let's just start doing that now. Uh, and so, but this comment is addressing that where it's like, you know, you're kind of undermining what is already the established kind of grading principles. You know what I mean? So I, I think it's kind of interesting. And, and I, if it were me, I just kind of feel like they should stick to nine eights because that's just how the company was built. And it doesn't really make sense to pivot to this nine, nine uh, model. Although I suspect it's probably, you know, the next frontier for them, you know, in terms of what's the next revenue stream, what's the next way for us to increase profits um, is giving opportunity to opportunity for people to chase the nine nines and tens. So, you know, it kind of makes sense right there, but I thought what was really interesting about that video was that what it told me was that these books are being graded relative to each other and not so much graded by the book itself, because the way in which he did it is he looked at the stack, you know, he looked at the stack of books that are all like this. And he just immediately looked at the spine to determine like, okay, these spines look better than these spines. Therefore this gets lifted into the potential nine, nine category. So already you're grading books relative to the pile and not individually, which in theory, based on how they present it, it should be individual books being graded as their own thing. So I thought that that was kind of interesting and, and really like kind of, I don't know, put a little bit of a, 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 you know, a question mark in the whole process. Although this is the process. It is what it is, right? You know, you have to kind of just know this is what they do and uh, it shouldn't really have to affect, you know, how you want to go about your collecting as long as you know that this is what they do, right? And, and that's one of the things that, you know, I tried to do in my reaction to that video is, is I actually like CGC doing content like this. And I, and I, and I want to applaud them when they deserve to be applauded because transparency is a good thing. I mean, we can disagree with how they grade. We can disagree with their processes, but if this is their process, like that's totally fine. Like they're their own company, like they can have it. So as long as we know how they approach stuff, then we can decide if we want to use their business or not. And, and I think overall doing a video like this was actually um, a net positive uh, for the community. Uh, Matthew here said, 79 nines from this batch is absolutely bonkers. 
little bit of context in case you guys didn't see this one. He, it was, I think 500 new comic books and 70 of them were nine nines or maybe it was 400. So it was about like a 20% nine nine rate. Uh, like they are just saying with this video, nine nine is the new nine eight. We messed up before in the last two decades of this grading and this is the new normal. Yeah, much like this comment right here, right? This is the new normal. It, it kind of is the new normal, you know? Uh, David says, watching this video, I'm actually now less confident in CGC doing grading between 9899 and 10 books. This is actually quite a damning video about how cavalier they are in handing out these grades. They appear to have skipped the part where some hipsters in re the receiving department drops your bundle and says, oopsie, then passes it off to the grader who can officially reject it. But it's never their fault because if your books were damaged, it must have been the post office. Do you guys think that CGC damages a lot of books? Like, like honest question. Okay. Not the never slabbers, not the never, like I, I need level headed responses here. What do you think the percentage of books do, does CGC damage? Let me break that into two parts. What's the percentage of books that CGC damages as a company? And what's the percent of books that the graders themselves damage? I think the graders don't damage that many books. I'd be willing to say it's 0.01%, if that. One in every 1,000 books. That would be my guess. Now, CGC as a company, you know, when it gets into the warehouse and all that stuff, I can see books being being damaged in there. But I, I'm curious what you guys think about that. Let me check in with the chat a little bit, see if anyone has anything to say. Uh, sorry, I had to step away for a second. Did you say anything uh, about the Emmy? My older brother won for his film ending in 2014, but has been nominated three times. So, Carissa, that's awesome. Uh, congrats to your brother. Uh, yeah, I did win an Emmy. That's a real Emmy uh, behind me. I've told the story a couple times here on the channel. It's a uh, Emmy for a commercial campaign that I directed. Uh, it wasn't an on-air award. You know, I didn't get to put on the black tie and walk on stage, but uh, it's it's the real deal. You know, it's the real deal. And uh, yeah, it's pretty. Uh, I was pretty uh, surprised to uh, been notified that I won it. Um, I have one nine nine. Seeing the video makes me think more will be able to share in the joy of owning one. I believe it will still be rare. My two cents. I mean, it's going to be relatively rare, still proportional, Yellow Bro. Like we see that the rate is about twenty percent, and and I think again the way in which they positioned it, it's relative grading, right? It's relative to the pile. Like if you pulled out the nine nines that he had and the ten o he had, and you took one of those books and sent it in with a bunch of other nine, eight copper age books. Do you think that that book would get a nine, nine? I, I don't think so. So where I'm going with that is I think that nine, nine will still be relatively rare, but it's going to be less rare and it likely will still be the new nine, eight, or it will start to be the new nine, eight. All right, let's carry on with the comments here. Um, let's see. Min Hunter says, I think the most overlooked thing here is that there were all cardstock heavier paper books. Brand new cardstock stuff can get nine nines, but standard comics almost never can get above nine eight. I've submitted 7,000 books or more, honestly, and I've only ever gotten six nine nines, all of which were brand new cardstock, uh, lenticular, and metal moderns. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, for Mint Hunter, if you guys don't know, great YouTube channel. Um, I think for what this kind of showed me, again, is, is kind of what we've been saying, where it's it's the relative grading aspect. Like if you send in 400 copies of the same brand new book, I mean, it is it is true that the book, like certain books look better relative to the same book. So it is easier, you know, with the human eye to kind of say like, I mean, yeah, this copy is nicer than this one right here. And so I wonder if, you know, for Mint Hunter, it's like how many of your submissions have been like, oh, I'm submitting literally a hundred copies of Dark Hawk number one. Like, I bet if you did it that way, you might increase your nine, nine chances. But how many people are, are actually sending, you know, um, 
you know, a hundred copies of the same book. Probably not too many. I mean, it's really mostly publishers or retailers who are doing their own exclusives or, you know, new comic books that are being sent in by a big comic book store or things like that. And, and I think that that's probably why you see more of those entities getting those nine nines and tens, because I mean, we saw the process in which they did it. Uh, Matt, what's going on, man? Uh, the concept was of the next frontier for profits profits for a grading company kind of undermines the whole purpose of an objective grading company. I agree with that. I mean, I'm not saying that that's what they're saying, but it kind of feels like that's what they're saying, right? I, I still want to um, try to get, you know, a couple of people from CGC on the channel um, to be on the Swigglecast series, you know, the, the, the episodes where I have a little more of a podcast conversation. And I want to ask that question, you know, like, what is CGC? Because maybe we're the ones that have a misunderstanding of what their company is. Are they an objective grading company? You know, is that actually their MO? Maybe we have it wrong, you know? Maybe they're a collectible creation factory. In which case, they're doing a great job doing that. Absolutely agree. How can they grade any individual copy, a 9, 9, or 10, without a large reference set if that is the method of real-time differentiation? Yeah, I think you're right, Austin. I, I think it's, it's, you know, you need things to compare it to. And I think that that's what helps them feel justified in giving the 10. Because I, I got to say, I, I can't imagine that it's, you know, a small feat to like the grader to say, oh, I'm going to give this book a 10, right? Like, you know, you're not like just grading New Mutants 98 and just on the whim on a Tuesday decide like, yeah, I'm going to give this book a 10. Like, no way, right? Like there has to be like some people in the building other senior graders and people that are going to be like, Hey, are we going to green light this 10? You know, are, are we actually going to put a 10 on the market? Cause it's a big deal if a 10 shows up on the market. Now in modern, 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 like ultra modern stuff, I think they probably don't care as much, you know, but that's where you get the relative comparisons. <clears throat> uh, the meanster says for real, we just need to go to an eight, nine or 10 grading system. <clears throat> None of this point BS. Uh, one through 10, uh, that's it. Uh, then we are forced to buy the book and not the grade. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, I kind of agree with you here on that front in so much as like, why did we get this half grading? And then when it gets to the nines, the point two grading. I mean, I suppose you needed this kind of scale because of the minutia of differences in books. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there are other grading companies that I've heard rumors might be looking to get into comic book writing and they have point systems that are just the numbers. Seven, eight, nine, 10. And I would speculate that that's something that that potential grading company that potentially might be entering this potential market in this hypothetical situation um, might be considering for their grading scale. And if anything, it, it might actually be a smart move to do that because people like big numbers, right? Like there is something satisfying about a 10 on your CGC case. You know, it's, it's like lizard brain stuff. It's like, oh, it's a 10, you know? And I think that's kind of why like CGC is like, oh, let's push it to the nine, nine, let's push it to the 10. And even CBCS, with their new labels. It's like, oh, they give like a black label that says 10 L, you know, and the nine, nine is like gold tinted or whatever. So people are kind of, um, you know, they're, they're, they're attracted to that, to those, uh, to those sort of flashy kind of numbers and those round things and stuff. So I kind of think this new grading company should just do tens. And then people will start to be like, ah, I'd rather have the 10 than the nine, eight, 10 is bigger than nine. Eight, so it's better. I would imagine, I can see that happening. Um, let's check in here. Uh, the cottage industry of signing, uh, wasn't enough for them. They'll keep finding ways of ring out more profits and the whole project of grading will get further under mine. Yeah. I mean, it's capitalism, right? It's like, you have to, if you don't grow, you're eventually going to die. So you have to 
going to graded pulps, you got to grade VHS, you got to grade, you know, I don't know, pins, coffee cups, headphones. Obviously the things that are on my, my desk right now. Um, you have to expand, you know, that, that's just a part of the nature of, you know, having a business at that scale. Uh, just kind of getting caught up here. I think out of 200 plus books, I've personally submitted that were nine, eight or better. I've had one nine, nine and one 10, uh, and only from cover cardstock, leather, a specialty type. So comic show, like, do you, so you submitted 200 plus books. How many have you submitted together as like a, like, I'm assuming like maybe you've done a 25 book nine, eight pre-screen type of thing. Because again, I think what we've, I'd be curious if, if you're, if you would have better luck, if those 200 books went together, I think you would based on what we've seen. Um, also congrats on being funded so quickly, quickly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, going to put in my pledge pre-order today. Woo. I appreciate that. Hey, let's check in. Let's check in. Do you guys know I wrote a comic book around the Kickstarter? Where are we at? 11, 150, 51 backers, holler, holler. Pretty good. Pretty good. Not bad. Not bad. Oh, it got updated to 56. It doesn't matter. It's fine. Same. A few more people came in. I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone. That's super awesome. I'm super excited about that. Um, all right. Well, let me kind of quickly finish out this topic with CGC right here. Again, uh, Ryan over at Automatic Comic Books uh, did a reaction to my video where he was reacting to the comments. So I now want to go to his comment section to do a reaction of his reaction of my reaction so that we can be in this perpetual multiverse of content generation here on YouTube. Uh, so Ryan had a reacting to the comments from my video. And I kind of want to see if there's any interesting comments on his. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ryan. One of the big takeaways for me, just stay away for now from any post 1980 book or any high census population book from any era, Incredible Hulk 181, ASM 252 and 300, the downward pressure on 9-8 graded books from the big population cohorts uh, could be immense over the next several years. Stick to low population gold and silver age keys and minor keys where the census is nearly complete and there isn't likely to be any kind of influx of books to be created. Uh, yeah, I agree with this comment a lot. And I think that this is one of the things that is maybe the most sort of concerning, alarming, worrisome. Um, if you are of the anti nine, nine train, you know, let's, let's actually really quickly, let's do this. Let's do this correctly here. Let me just quickly pull up some information. I got to log in. You guys can't see my, my password. All right. Uh, all right. I think we're here. We're in Go Collect here. We're going to pull up New Mutants 98. And I want to show this and talk about this. Uh, relative to the comment that we saw um, on Ryan's video. So New Mutants 98, we all know this book, right? First appearance of Deadpool, hot book. I mean, always a hot book, right? Uh, are you guys excited about Deadpool Wolverine? I think it could be pretty good. 24,548 universal copies. 98s have 4,300. Average price around, you know, 1,200, 1,300, 1,400. Nine nines are 12 on the census. And the last sale for one of those uh, was in 2023, not quite a year ago, eight months ago, that was at the $40,000 range. And a 10 ohm was, there's one on the census. So this is one of the worries, you know, with nine nine pre screen, the potential of nine nines coming into the market more so because. It's already such an expensive book for a lot of these copper age grails or whatever you want to call them, mega keys, uh, first appearance books. Um, it, it's already a massive premium that people pay for these types of books. You know, the the 99 New Mutants 98 or the 99 um, 
ASM 252. Is there a 99 ASM 252? Or if, in theory, if there's a 99 ASM 300, you know, first Venom. And as soon as you open up, like, hey, we're going to add more pre screens, like, hey, maybe there's 98 crack and press potential. Hey, you know, um, we want to start doing, you know, these books more liberally as far as the grades in which we give out. Um, all it takes is just a couple more books to be added to a very, go collect, come on. <sighs> Website fail. Okay. It doesn't matter. All it takes is for a very few amount of books to be added to the census for the value to decrease, right? I mean, there's 12 nine nines and the value of this book is the last sale was $40,000. If let's say you just end up adding four extra copies because all of a sudden people are cracking and pressing nine eights, you know, going for that chase, you know, trying to submit through nine nine pre screen. If all of a sudden you just add even four, I mean, what does that do to the price? It knocks down a percentage because how many people are actually, you know, in the market to buy this book? You know, for all we know, this $40,000 price tag could just be between two people who really, really wanted it. And this is the first one that came up in however many years and they were just got into bidding war. But now one of them owns the book. So there's only one other person out there that actually really wants it. And if all of a sudden you add four to the market, well, that's absolutely going to tank the price. And so I think that that's kind of what Matt was getting at here in this comment is if you're somebody who's pushing, you know, and, and, and owns, you know, a nine, nine, of that type of variety of book, I, this is something I'd be, it would be super concerning. It definitely would be super concerning, you know? So I don't know. I think it's really interesting, you know, with, with everything going on with the nine, nine pre-screen and, and what potentially it could mean for the future of those comic books. But I think in the ultra modern space, uh, we're definitely going to, uh, uh get more nine nines and, uh, you know, people are going to be, upset with CGC and you're going to feel it in the comments, uh, in those types of transparency videos, because, um, uh, as we're hearing out of the Paul Lesko Twitter, you know, where people are, uh, uh, or, or we're getting just cases being reached at settlement and it feels like, you know, we're not getting the justice that we so desperately seek in the comic book collecting market, but Hey, that's okay. Swaggle only sends out nine, eight candidates. You're dang right. I, I, if I had a modern book, to be honest, I mean, I would hope that it could get a nine, eight. I mean, it depends on the value. Nine, six is still have value. Nine, four is have value. It depends on what it is. Um, Comic Shell says, yeah, I usually don't do pre-screen sent in 25, sometimes less. I've seen certain YouTubers with their own exclusive variants send hundreds and pull nines in since. So I think that take is correct. Yeah, I think we saw how it works. And if, and, and the, the frustrating thing is, is, you know, of the nine nines that he pulled in that video, do we think that if you pulled that say like stack of 20 or whatever it was, and you sent those 20 as a nine, eight pre-screen, do you think they would all come back nine, nine? I doubt it. I doubt it. It would have to be relative to each other. All right, let's go on to our next story here. Something that I wanted to talk a little bit about, maybe hear what you guys think about this, but we are just one day away from the debut of X-Men 97. Now, I think you would have to be a contrarian curmudgeon to say that X-Men 97 wasn't your favorite cartoon growing up. Because we all know that it was, it was the best cartoon ever made and we all loved it. And it all made us buy Jim Lee X-Men number ones at every single comic book store in the early nineties. So as you guys know, Marvel is bringing back this show. Uh, it premieres tomorrow and you do have to wonder, you know, is it going to be any good? It's very interesting recent uh, thing with the Bo DeMeo, the, showrunner was actually fired. It's not really explained why he got fired from the show. Uh, presumably something to do with, you know, um, not being uh, okay with the mouse. You know, I think he had an OnlyFans or something like that. So some kind of controversial 
part in his personal life that uh, he got removed from. But the show's coming out, and I'm curious of what's going on in the comic book market. Because I know that X-Men 97 has a broad reach, and I've started to see people who are not into comics, and people who, frankly, aren't even that in tune to the current MCU that have been sort of talking about the show. Like they've been kind of interested in it. And, and, and it is interesting if this is going to be like a nostalgia uh, bait that is going to capture some people. And what I found really interesting is here in the recent key collector trending 20 list, what do you see making the list? Uncanny X-Men 200, the trial of Magneto, which this was one of the animated cells that first got released, uh, you know, when the show was announced that we are going to probably see this depiction of Magneto. At least we know that he's currently the head of the school, at least from the trailer. And then, of course, everyone's favorite, X-Men number one, Jim Lee, which I, I kind of feel like is the book that at least I associate it to the X-Men cartoon. I mean, I, th I think that this is kind of when they did the official costume design and had that sort of new synergy. And we're kind of seeing them, you know, be be the hottest books this week. We also have a Marvel Comics Presents 72. I don't know if that has any uh, correlation to what's going on, but I don't know. There's so many of these books in the market. Like, that's one of the things with, you know, hot lists is that, frankly, if, if a hot list was being truly, truly accurate, like what's the hottest book that week that has sold the most? The truth is it's Spawn number one, X-Men number one, Jim Lee edition. And like Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man number one, those books literally sell the most every single week. And if it was truly an accurate list for hot lists that came out week to week, it would just be those books all the time, but that would be boring. So you have to curate them a little bit. So I don't think that we're going to see the market move all that much with X-Men 97 here. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's also an animation thing animation tends to not have much effect, at least as I've been kind of anecdotally following, you know, how these properties move the secondary market. Rarely seems like animation uh, moves the needle at all, even if it is a movie like, you know, Into the Spider-Verse and Miles Morales and everyone's super excited. I mean, that did have probably, the, that's probably the best example of books uh, getting popular, like your spider punks and your spider noirs and things like that. But it really doesn't move at the same level as say secret wars number five when the Deadpool trailer comes out. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm excited to check out the show, but I'm also not going to hold my breath. I'm not convinced that it's going to be the thing that I've been waiting for, you know, since childhood, you know, I, I don't know. It's maybe I'm just a uh, jaded and have a black heart and hope has been lost, you know, in me. I've, I've no faith in having properties tickle, tickle me in the way that they used to, but I don't know. What do you guys think about X-Men 97? I mean, we'll, we'll watch it. We'll see if it's going to be any good. Um, but in the wake of X-Men 97, it seems like Marvel Publishing has also kind of released uh, new X-Men titles. So trying to create that synergy with X-Men right now. You have Deadpool Wolverine, you have new X-Men titles coming out with a new new creative teams. And you know, I'm sure that these mod these current comic books are going to be hot for a little bit, but will they have the staying power? I don't know. It's 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 really hard to follow a lot of these series because there's a lot of hype when they first come out, but then there's, you know, delays and then creatives turnover and you know the story changes and what was once you know kind of a promising run um you know ends up sort of fizzling out or at least takes too long for maybe people to stay invested but uh there's gonna be three new x-men titles coming out we have x-men exceptional x-men which frankly i do not like exceptional x-men i don't like the title i don't like it how do you guys feel about exceptional and then of course the uncanny x-men jed mckay and ryan stegman on X-Men, which McKay's a great writer and Stegman's a great artist. So, you know, I, I think that that will be a solid series. Um, Ewing and Canero and uh, Gail Simone and stuff, obviously seasoned writers who, you know, have done good work. I'm not as big on them as I am McKay, but, you know, they seem to be bringing out some of the bigger guns here. And um, 
you know, we'll see. We'll see if it's going to be any good. I mean, did you guys read House of X, like the Hickman one? It was pretty good, but, you know, Hickman going to Hickman. You know, it's like so dense when you read some of this stuff. And and to follow these stories in standard sequential comic format is really just, it's actually just too difficult, I think. Did you guys get that feeling? Like, it's not that it's not good. It's not that it's not doesn't make sense. It's just that it's like, by the time the next issue, you're like, I forgot what's going on, you know? So that, that's one of the tough things with the, with the X-Men thing. And, and if all these X-Men are going to cross over and then you see all these spinoffs, Phoenix, X-Factor, Storm, Nyx, X-Force, Wolverine. I mean, this seems to be the big summer event uh, crossover comic series that they're going with, um, which again, makes a lot of sense. Tied into X-Men 97, tied into Deadpool, Wolverine. Um, if anything, more than X-Men 97 moving the market. I actually do think that whatever happens in some of these stories uh, might move a lot of the comic book market as well. Um, so we'll have to keep our eye out on that, you know? Uh, circumstances in the house. Jen McKay makes it tempting, but nah. Yeah, I mean, I liked, uh, you know, he, he was on Moon Knight and I think he did a pretty good job. Um, admittedly, I read it on Marvel Unlimited. So it, it's not enough for me to buy the issues. And I'm sorry. And and you go support your comic creators who do Kickstarters. Buy their issues because they need your help. And buy buy Jim McKay's. And don't 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 just read it on on Marvel Unlimited. I guess he still gets paid with Marvel Unlimited. It doesn't matter. Anyways, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of titles to follow. It's a lot of titles to follow. So so we'll see how it goes. You know, overall. Uh, trades, uh, really make a ton more sense than collecting floppies, but I love the thrill. Yeah. We're, you know, we're in it forever. Like with, uh, us getting single issues, like we're just, it's, it's habitual for us, you know, but if I'm being truly honest, you know, trades, that's how I read, you know, trade trades, trades is the way to go. You know, you got to read the trades. It's just so much easier to follow the story. Uh, Parker says, instead of Secret Wars, it seems as if Annihilation Conquest would have been a great way to bring FF into the MCU, a small tweak to the original story, but use the negative zone. Well, you know, Parker, I mean, maybe that's still going to be what we get. That might, there might be some version of that, you know, when we bring in FF. Like, I think right now, you know, based on the image that they sent, it does seem like it's going to be a period piece. So... Are they lost in time? Are they in the negative zone? Is the place where Kang was in Ant-Man, is that the same as the negative zone? You know, how many zones are there? How many dimensions are there? Is the mirror dimension the same as the negative zone? Is the negative zone the same as the multiverse? Is the multiverse the same as whatever portal the marvels went through i think it is i don't know it's, it's hard it's hard to say i wonder if animation is an area of marvel studios where writers aren't micromanaged to death by the studio execs which is where i think most of the drop in quality originates from just a theory you know matt i think that there's something to that i think that one because it's animation it gets overlooked right it gets a little more dismissed and i'm somebody who i really liked what if I know not everyone liked What If, but What If, I think, is a really great show. And it's very well written. Not every episode is, is, is exceptional. But a lot of the episodes are very well, well written. And I liked it a lot. And that's another, you know, um, plus in the animation side. But the other thing I think, Matt, and you would totally get this, as if you guys know, Matt is a writer. I think the animation pipeline takes so much longer because you have to start drawing everything that you can't have too many pivots and rewrites in the same way you can with live action where they can say like, oh, we want to do this scene now. And it's like, get everyone better. We're just going to film it again. And it's like the animation team can't turn around the drawing stuff as fast as executives want to give notes. So I, I, I'm willing to bet that their scripts and screenplays are finished um, ahead of time, or at least relatively more ahead of time than the live action counterparts. 
It's all connected, man. It's all connected. All right. We've been streaming for about an hour now. I just kind of wanted to do, you know, a little bit of an early morning stream to kind of celebrate the launch of our Kickstarter here. Sanity Issues 1 through 3. We got funded in less than two hours. I am extremely grateful and humbled to everyone out there who has supported so far. Um, 11,974, 60 backers. We're going to be doing this for 29 days, guys. We're going to be on the campaign trail. If you guys are interested in supporting um, my comic book, uh, you guys want to check it out. Uh, I put a link to the Kickstarter in the description. Uh, you can take a look, watch the video, um, take a read of, of what's you know going on in the story, see if it's something that you're into. Uh, this is something that I'm super passionate about. I have an amazing team of people working on this with me. Um, you can see we have different sort of tiers here. The covers got variant covers. If you're into the kind of abstract modern look, we got uh, some of the EC title covers here, which are you know classic homages. Uh, we have a, a a free mystery unlock cover, huh? Mystery unlock. Hmm. But we have uh, page previews right there, and then um, you know we have uh, other great you know rewards from the team. Uh, we got uh, original art for sale. I actually do believe someone claimed this today, the original art sketch for uh, my key art. Uh, but we have comic book pages you can get if you guys are an OA collector. Uh, the covers have, I think, already been claimed. Um, and then this uh, beautiful oil painting right here from Jarrell Threat. Uh, one of one, original oil painting, exceptional Magic the Gathering artist. Um, this is kind of the grand prize of the tier. But uh, you can get that if you're kind of like a oil painting, uh, or, uh, original art collector. So, you know, definitely check it out. And, um, yeah, I'm super, super excited. It's been, it's been a great, great day so far. And I appreciate you guys hanging out and, and supporting, but before I totally wrap up the show, you know, and I think I might do a stream later on tonight. I think I might come back for another stream. I'll come up with some other interesting topics. We might have some guests. I might try to get some of the guys on the show. We'll see. But the last topic I wanted to sort of cover and just make it known to you guys. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. I think I might do a, a more extensive video on this uh, particular book soon. Certainly, I will do an auction preview. But we got to talk about some big boy books. Some big boy books. Not only big boy books, the biggest, boyest book to have ever booked in the comic book market Action Comics, number one, Kansas City Pedigree, first appearance of Superman in a CGC 8.5 with off-white to white pages, finishes auction in a few weeks, and currently is sitting at $4,860,000 on This is 100% going to be the most expensive comic book ever sold in the history of comic books. Now, the current record is for a Superman number one. I believe it was graded in the eight or seven range. I could be wrong on that. And that one went for $5 million. So this is like, you know, 100,000 off. But that sale was a private sale. And if you guys happen to see my podcast with Sean from Reserved Investments, he kind of let it be known, you know, anytime there's private sale, guys, you got to be a little bit skeptical of those private sales being real. So as far as live auction, real sales, real, because it could all be smoke and mirrors. Uh, I think we've seen, you know, the $3 million sale for AF-15, First Appearance of Spider-Man. Uh, but this right here, as far as uh, uh, what we assume is transparency, is going to be the most expensive comic book to ever sell, uh, it's going to definitely cross five million, and it could shatter the record. It could shatter the record tremendously. Some people ha say that this is going to hit the ten million dollar mark. Frankly, I have no idea. Now, the only thing to consider is that there are two copies that are graded universally higher than this. Presumably, as far as I understand it, those two copies are owned by the same person and that person is never going to sell them. That's what I've heard. But of course, that's me playing telephone with people 
And so I don't actually know if that's true. So ipso facto, this is in theory, the highest copy that will ever come to market, at least until the person who owns the two higher graded copies moves on. But, you know, maybe he's going to pass them down to his family or whatever, or, or she, you know, whoever it is. But what do you think about this, guys? Do you think that this got a little bit of golden age love? Because take a look here. I mean, it's a nice book. It's a nice copy. But I don't know, man. Got some uh, crease right there. Pretty decent crease right here. You know, some color breaks up there at the top. And then, of course, the corners and stuff. And uh, front cover looks pretty good outside that. But then you go to the back cover and a little bit of tanning up here, you know. Tanning going on. And then some kind of, I don't know what you want to call that grime here at the bottom. It's not that it's bad, but 8.5? I mean, there's no way that an ultra-modern book is getting an 8.5 with this damage, right? There's no way. So I wonder if that's going to slow it down a little bit as far as the, you know, the value ceiling is concerned for this. But then again, this is Action Comics number one. This is the first appearance of Superman. I think we all forget how awesome Superman is. Yeah, I said it. Superman is awesome. I know everyone likes Batman more. I know everyone thinks Superman is lame and a Boy Scout and boring. But I think when James Gunn comes out with Superman and he hits it out of the park, I do. Superman... Superman's inspiring. Superman is the man. And this is the grail of grail comic books. So I just kind of wanted to quickly talk about it, you know, on stream. Give a, give some predictions. I wonder if it's going to double. Could he go to 10 million? I mean, 5 million is already a lot. We're only two, we're, we're up two plus weeks out. So I don't know, like it could go to 10. It really could, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it's going to fall short of that. I don't think we're ready for a $10 million comic book yet. I think we are sticking with seven figures for now. So I'm going to say we're going to go to eight, eight, seven, nine, eight, eight, seven, nine. So we'll see. It's very, very exciting though. I think it's fun. It's fun to cover some of these books, you know, to see some of these big sales, to see some of these big numbers and to uh, pretend like um, I'm the person buying them. So I think that's it, guys. I think I'm going to wrap up the stream right there. You know, wanted to do a quick stream to sort of celebrate the launch of uh, my Kickstarter for Sanity, talk a few, about a few interesting topics, had to address a little bit of the CGC stuff, had to address X-Men 97, which comes out tomorrow. Um, of course, Heritage Auctions, the big boy book coming out. Uh, we'll get back to our regularly scheduled program this week, you know, with comic book content, follow some of the market. I uh, haven't been able to uh, put out as many videos as I wanted to on the channel recently because I've been gearing up for the Kickstarter. Uh, but now that that's kind of going on, we'll go back to, you know, our usual coverage and we'll see what's happening out there in secondary comic book collecting land. But I want to say thanks again, guys, for joining me on stream this morning. Once again, if you guys are interested, willing, you know, um, and want to support me and this comic book, the team we put together, Sanity, issues one through three, really it's two and three that came out. One is already available, but you can get one in this Kickstarter if you don't have it. Launched earlier this morning, less than two hours, we hit our goal, which is great. It means that it's going to be a real thing. It means that it's actually going to happen. And I'm, I'm, I'm super humbled. I mean, it, it, it's something I'm super, super passionate about. Um, you guys know me. I'm, I'm huge into vintage comics. We have a whole channel dedicated to it. Uh, you know, I, I, I love genre storytelling, you know, working for, you know, horror and, and, and D and D and magic, the gathering and these properties that, that I often work on. And so being able to kind of put, bring those worlds together and, and take it back to sort of that root of, uh, you know, 
vintage comic book storytelling and pulp adventures and put it in a Lovecrafting setting is, is, is something that uh, is, is a ton of fun for me to be in that world. And, and I hope, um, you know, it, it's, it's something that you guys connect with. You know, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting themes within like kind of the cosmic horror and the Lovecraftian universe, you know, the, the, the fear of the unknown and, and, uh, you know, understanding reality, what is truth, what isn't, uh, that actually kind of mirrors a lot to, you know, our world today. You know, we live in a perpetual, you know, um, online existence where truth is harder and harder to find. Everyone kind of lives a subjective reality. Like what is objective reality these days? What do people really know? Like who can you trust? And I think that there's there's something within the kind of themes of Lovecraft and, and what I tried to get in the story that kind of taps into that a little bit, you know, um, trying to find truth uh, is really something that has to be kind of an individual effort. Um, and you have to sort of be distrusting of a lot of information that you get. Um, you got to be a good detective and private investigator. So that is my comic book. If you guys want to give it a shot, check it out. I'd really, really help, uh, really, really, um, you know, be thankful if you guys uh, want to do it. It helps support me on this channel. I mean, one of the things with doing my YouTube is, uh, you know, I'm not a comic book dealer. So this is sort of my way of being like, hey, you want to support me and, and the things I've done on my YouTube, um, maybe you'll enjoy a, a comic book story that you can kind of get your hands on. So uh, link is in the description. Take a look, see if it's for you. And um, I really, really appreciate you guys. Anyone who backed. Uh, let me answer this question really quick. Signed copies. Yes, uh, you will be able to get signed copies. Uh, I actually did not create a tier specifically for signed copies, uh, but any tier that you support, I will sign your books upon request. That's kind of what I had in it. So I'll set it up. So if you want me to do signed copies, I'll sign any, any of the books. And actually, hopefully, I'm hoping that uh, I might do some stretch goal stuff. And I'd love to get the variant cover artist and the artist to sign copies as well. Ivan lives in Singapore. You know, uh, Santiago is in Colombia, sometimes Argentina. So getting them the books to sign is a little bit of a thing, but I, I, I want to try to make that happen if people are into the sign stuff. So uh, stay tuned for that. But anyways, that's all I got for this stream, guys. Thank you so much again for hanging out with me this morning. Hopefully you found it entertaining and fun. Uh, consider supporting Sanity, the Kickstarter. Link is in the description. And uh, yeah, we'll see where we go from here. Always stuff to talk about in the comic book market. And um, I guess I'll sign off from there. Thanks so much for watching, guys. See y'all in the next stream.